another <laughs> glorious week, Mr. Ko. How are you? I'm well. I can't. I, this is like living in fast forward. It seems like two days ago we were doing last week's show, and now here we are again, which is good because I look forward to this. But odd because I, the sense of time is just so uh, so distorted in a way. <laughs> it's like, what did I do? In you know, in this intervening period, and bam, here we are again. It's almost like we have to uh, measure our progress in our work by how much we get done in between these shows. I think that might be the, uh, the <laughs> might be the new metric for success. Well, I'm excited. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Intersections. Uh, this is a fantastic, fantastic opportunity to uh, learn and share and grow and unlearn uh, as we create this new future forward together. And I'm so excited uh, to have uh, with us some fantastic guests and as always my co-host John Kao, co-founder as well of uh, Intersections, whom I'll introduce more formally. Uh, but before we kick things off, I want to remind you that uh, you are part of this uh, and we welcome your engagement and your participation. So please share with us where you're tuning in from, Share with us your observations or comments from what you're hearing from us or our guests. Uh, also share with us any questions you have for them. Send any ideas or recommendations you have. Also, uh, John and I go through the comments uh, following the show, uh, and we do respond and engage with you uh, between uh, between events and between episodes. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's really a community. So you're an active participant in it. Uh, I'd like to formally now welcome you to Intersections, which uh, our formal uh, intro is that we're a weekly conversational jam session that happens right here every week at 1030 to 1130 Pacific uh, it's a jam session that dives deep into the intersections among technology, innovation, culture, and ideas. We bring diverse personalities uh, and worldviews together in service of greater understanding and unlearning. And as you saw, if you tuned in from last week, and if you didn't, you got to patch in to see it. We had Scott Page from Pink Floyd and Think Experience uh, on with us. Uh, we try to feature the the best, most creative, most brilliant minds. We talk about innovation. We talk about artistry. Uh, we talk about creativity uh, and all of those things. That's the intersection. Uh, that's what makes this show so special. What also makes this show so special is my co-host, John Kao, whom The Economist has called Mr. Creativity. He is a thought leader, an entrepreneur, an advisor. He has been uh, He's taught at Harvard Business School. He served as visiting faculty at MIT Media Lab in Stanford. Uh, he is also an artist. Uh, he's a Tony-nominated producer of Film and Stage. He wrote the best-selling book, Jamming, the Art and Discipline of Business Creativity. And he also chairs the Institute for Large-Scale Innovation. Mr. Kao, welcome to <laughs> Intersection. Well, thanks, Brian. And uh, I am going to reciprocate by... Um... Uh, introducing your good self. Uh, I can't think of anyone I'd rather intersect with in this medium because Brian has also made a career out of taking innovation out of the realm of cliches and um, standard operating procedure and into a, a frontier discipline that has been informed by so many things. He was digital before digital was cool, to paraphrase a well-known music uh, industry uh, a phrase and uh, has made linkages between the um, exploding and emerging area of digital technology and innovation and marketing and social media and so many other uh, elements that comprise the fabric of our new way of doing things. Uh, he's a polymath communicator, keynote speaker, author, and even has a day job, believe it or not, which is uh, innovation evangelist, global innovation evangelist, I might add, for Salesforce. So, hey, Brian. Here we are. Hey, hey, John. So I'm excited. Uh, for those uh, who follow along, uh, you've seen that uh, both John and I have come to you respectively from different parts of California and sometimes like today, uh, California and Nevada. Uh, but next week, we are going to be live in the same studio together, uh, namely John's place uh, in San Francisco. <laughs> Uh, I will be traveling to San Francisco, traveling actually for work for the first time in a year, uh, where I will actually be going to our headquarters, the mothership, uh, and recording some videos for Australia for a virtual presentation. And John lives right down the street, so we will actually 
bringing will be bringing the show live to you from his incredible studio. And John, if I am not mistaken, you have both doses. Is that correct? I do. I'm uh, Moderna number two, and two weeks after that, so I'm uh, at least in my own mind uh, quite protected. Excellent. Excellent. Ah, so excited. I'm so excited. And uh, we're also going to have dinner the night before. So this is this sort of a semblance, a taste of what... It's uh, interesting. Life- you know, we, we talked about this show and then everything from the pre-planning through everything we've done for the last now almost over six months has been done virtually. I mean, Brian and I have not seen each other face to face during the entire uh, inception and you know, prosecution of this show. So that'll this will be a first. Who knows that what we're going to talk about? <laughs> that will be a first. And also, uh, I haven't seen you in person since November of 2019. Yeah, that's right. We had the famous Indian dinner. That's right. Wow. Okay, well, um, let's jump in because we have yeah. a fantastic guest uh, who's waiting back. We have, boy, two fantastic guests waiting backstage. Uh, first... Let's see. I've been told that I'm taking over producer uh, capabilities while Gregarious is on a call. Uh, Mark Silva. Mark, welcome. How you doing, my man? Hey, great to see you. Well, I'm going to do a formal intro for you, and then we'll kick things off. And as I pass it to you, it'll probably be a good place to start of sharing sort of where, where you're at, a little bit about Kite, uh, and then also uh, where we're going in this post-pandemic economy. So I've known Mark for, oh, I don't even want to count how many years. So it's definitely over a decade. Uh, I last saw Mark several months ago at Alice's in Woodside, where we caught up safely uh, over a cup of coffee uh, and a motorcycle ride. And that day was a car ride, actually. If I remember correctly, I had to have an oil change uh, and had to had to meet you in a convertible, which was not too bad as a compromise. But uh, Mark uh, is also the, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Kite. And I would love, Mark, if you just want to tee up what you're doing, um, the inspiration behind Kite, what Kite's working on, and we'll just dive into questions. Yeah, well, first, uh, thank you, John and Brian. I've been really enjoying the Intersections Live podcast. So excited to contribute to the jam. Um, this uh, location, actually, you know, if anything can't happen, it will happen. Uh, this location uh, is not mine. The internet net went down today, and that <laughs> is exactly what happens with the startup gods. And uh, anything uh, that can't happen will go happen. We we adapt. Um, way back in the day, uh, Brian, I, I think I showed you shared with you um, the uh, you know the back of the napkin that was was, uh, was kite, and and it it it's just appropriate for this. Yeah, can everybody see? Can you uh, bring that uh, sketch? This is literally the back of the napkin that we had. That uh, way back you know, when we would usually be this week at South by Southwest jamming together, uh, you would see events and media. You would see venture and tech consulting, and the consulting might be like classic consultants like EY, Bain, McKinsey, or it might be uh, Silicon Foundry or um, even tech stars that, that are helping inform enterprise education, government. And the problem with this whole sketch uh, that we saw, and I think we've all lived it, is that no one's using the exact same systems, the same rails, the same, they have different incentives, different business models. And so the fact that uh, it comes together at all is a miracle and usually had to happen at an event like a South by Southwest or a CES or whatever. So as we've gone digital with everything else, um, what Kite is building, which is largely an ecosystem platform that connects each of those areas, startups and enterprise, plus the consultancies and accelerators, um, uh, that, that has come to the fore as the way people are working now. And so it's been a, a big growing year for Kite uh, in, in, through 2020, and we expect that to be enduring uh, through 2021. So uh, a little bit more about Kite, what we do is, again, this is not a pitch for Kite, but it's basically more about the intersection and the intersectionality is uh, we help enterprise connect with all this fire hose of data they're getting from third-party d- data sources like Crunchbase, like CB Insights, like PitchBook, like you name it. Um, we connect the third-party data, startup data, all of their enterprise data and their accelerator partner data and recent Horowitz data, et cetera. And all that's brought into one place. So now they can finally orchestrate startup innovation across the entire enterprise. So that's that's in a summary what Kite does. 
Thanks, Mark. I'm going to uh, constantly balance all of these different windows and also share some of the screenshots from your site because it's so informative uh, and it's it's so unique. Uh, so when we when we sat together and went through the back of the napkin, uh, which is I guess such a such a you have it's it's like a Silicon Valley indoctrination. You can't not. Have you know, it. you know, a friend of ours, Elizabeth Will, who was over at Andreessen Horowitz and then over at Twitter. Um, she's a she's a, an artist as well, by the way. Have to bring her on the podcast. She just started Scribble Ventures, and she believes that every great idea starts with a scribble. So that was our <laughs> scribble. Well, you heard it here, folks. This is where that guest idea came to fruition. Mark, we'd love an introduction uh, if you if sure. you don't mind. And what a clever name, actually. Uh, so on that note, so John and I are going to pepper you with questions. And John, <laughs> I, I don't know that I'll just. I, I won't dominate the first half like we normally do. I'll just kind of pass it back and forth to keep it more interactive. But okay. Mark, um, what's changed uh, in terms of uh, enterprise uh, and what, you know, obviously the pandemic was a big control, del- control alt delete for a lot of people. Uh, some, something in, in some natures by force, like you have to now think differently moving forward. And in some cases sort of like, true inspiration like we get a chance to think differently about moving forward i'd love to hear from you the balance of what you're seeing from your partners and what they're looking f- for from the you know the startup ecosystem uh, or from innovation in general yeah so uh even before pandemic there's a realization outside's moving faster than the inside uh if we would have invented it if we could have invented our r d team t team or someone would have done so that's not happening there's a 94 percent dissatisfaction with the state of innovation from the C-suite looking at their innovation efforts across Global 2000, that's a McKinsey survey, and our data says the same. Um, Largely, uh, it's a problem of scale. And this is the number one, this has not changed. First of all, I'm gonna start with what hasn't changed. Um, Most things that look like innovation in companies look like tactics, they don't look like big scale business movements. They don't look like they're gonna change the world, and then they do, right? It starts slow and then goes fast. And um, the problem with uh, scale then is the corporation's answer to this is going to be, why don't we create a center of excellence? Why don't we partner with an accelerator? But even those programs don't tend to scale. So uh, what we find is you see a bunch of confederates building um, in different business units, different regions, different business lines and brands, et cetera, building their innovation practices, um, innovating within the practice, trying to work with the outside um, and, and trying to do that desperately. Um, and uh, until Kite, there really wasn't a system of record to do so, to unite all those efforts. So the, the number one issue uh, companies are dealing with is they usually don't have a process. They create programs, but those programs are constantly fighting for their survival and their relevance within the company. Um, they're almost like monks that go out and ask for alms to kind of pay for the <laughs> from the business units to pay for their function. Um, and, and then ultimately they're doing a lot of workflow management and not the work of innovation. So what's happened and what's changed through COVID is number one is 900 scouts that were sitting here, here in Silicon Valley suddenly had to wonder whether their value was being in Silicon Valley or not. And they've come back to the mothership, whether it's in Japan or whether it's in you know, Europe or whatever. And so they're having to virtualize some of those efforts. They're having to virtualize their events. They're having to virtualize their demo days. And in fact, we've actually partnered with TechCrunch to help live stream some of those demo days uh, for, for customers. Um, so it's largely, um, how do we virtualize this activity? That realization that we can do things different has been an accelerant uh, for what, what, what and how people are doing startup innovation. And frankly, it's overdue because the dissatisfaction was so great at the C-suite and at the board level of why aren't we moving faster? So um, one thing, I'd, yeah. I'd just like to baseline my knowledge because I've seen tons of incubators and uh, um, you know places that want to integrate functions and uh, deconstruct the entrepreneurial process. So um, you know, just in a meat and potatoes way, if we were to go to Kite and see Kite in action, what would we see? And number two, uh, how, how are you different from, let's say, the garden variety if there is such a thing, uh, incubator that's a public-private partnership in Ohio, or of you know a private sector incubator X Y Z location. Yeah, we love we love those. In fact, uh, our fastest growing area are actually accelerators and incubators. They're doing the really important work of regional and local 
um, right. uh, incubation of, of innovation. And it's usually by some sort of a technology or sector or regional strength that they have either from their ins educational institutions or industry. Um, so they're doing really important work. A lot of those incubators and accelerators are network rich, but technology poor. So Kite provides them with a technology to accept all their, uh, their uh, applications, do the review of the applications, but then share with more people, one or more groups outside of their organization. That's, that's, that's actually a really tough thing to do. Uh, so what usually people are doing is they're using spreadsheets, PowerPoints. That's largely what we're replacing. We're not replacing the actual physical or the focused programs that are doing the acceleration. We're digitizing the delivery of the uh, outcomes and the intelligence and the insights around that. So if you go to Kite to answer your question, yeah. if you go to Kite and you're an accelerator, you would, you would have a form that ingests all of your startups. You would have an application process. You would even have a Kanban board that would allow you to, uh, to uh, see the progress of each of the gates. And then you could share with one or more of your partners, corporate partners or internal partners, to be able to review input. And all that stuff then downstream is managed in one place. I'm still not quite getting it. So it sounds like it's a system of systems. Um, and yes, do you, do yeah, you we are integrating uh, APIs so from Crunchbase and Hour and similar web, and um, as well as from uh, all the uh, data that uh, companies and individuals are putting over the top of those startups. But in, in, in Kite itself, are people working on startups? I mean, in other words, when you walk in there, are there people busily working in pods and with equipment and so forth and so on? Or is it is it a more of a kind of um, software development um, integration hub for things that are actually happening outside of Kite? Uh, good question. So let me uh, do a reset then. Um, corporations will do their own internal uh, innovation, largely that's going to be sustaining innovation, right? H1 kind of activity. The H, the Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 activity that uh, is scouting around the edges is usually happening through partners that are consultancies, scouts, incubators, accelerators. Um, and when they get all that data in, it's largely coming in as spreadsheets, emails, et cetera, and Kite centralizes that. Um, for the actual software building and venture building, our thesis is you might as well partner with a startup because somewhere there's a founder out there who's trying to build that solution for you and is moving faster than it seems to be doing for anything that's non-core. And a lot of customers, are, a lot of the global 2000 companies are doing that as well. They're, they're excelling and getting much better at partnering. So Corp Dev and CVC and corporate innovation is not just a outpost anymore. It's becoming core to how they're working and they're getting better at actually working and accelerating how they make decisions and partner with startups. So Kite is a system to enable that. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, okay. While, while you're processing that, John, I'm going to ask a quick question, yeah. which is... Okay. Uh, I'm compiling right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I did some I did some research as as you know Mark it was some of the first research that looked at corporate innovation uh, with Capgemini and I remember that one of the reports that we had published found that seventy five percent of executives felt that their organizations were innovative but only something like thirty five percent of employees felt the same way that they could see on the front lines that the company was not innovative in, whatsoever and and then you add to that. Uh, this sort of board mentality that looks at, you know, quarter to quarter or short termism, as I call it, uh, which doesn't really give you the the wings or the or the runway to to invest in things that are going to have longer term ROI versus shorter term cost. Uh, how has that changed? And if it hasn't changed to the, your liking, what is it that needs to happen to get people to see longer term? Um, I actually think at the board and the C-suite level, the dissatisfaction with innovation is not the short term, it's the long term. It's that they want to see movement in a direction uh, at a scale that's meaningful so that within five years to seven years, which is largely almost venture-like ex expectations, that a billion dollars or two billion dollars of opportunity or savings or efficiencies or something are going to be built into the system. So actually at the board level, they're putting in place systems and programs and backing programs that will specifically enable that. So some maturity models on that. Visa 
has five different programs aimed at, tar at, at startups. The only one you hear about is the venture program that gets a check uh, for $5 billion every once in a while to buy, acquire a company. Um, but if you look at their open innovation program, 10,000 startups come through that. If you look at their corp dev program, a thousand companies have a big hug from the corporate development folks to help Visa enable startups uh, in the payment space. Um, they have over um, th three quarters of those 10,000 companies coming through are using their APIs in some way. So they have really sophisticated multi-pronged programs now that are specifically saying, how do we move at the speed of the outside for innovation? So um, another maturity model will be a company, uh, a large banking institution, not largely known for moving quickly, where there's amazing activity happening in almost every business unit and three different business units from the data team, the consumer team, the treasury and transaction services team, the corp ventures team, they're all meeting with startups and accelerating things, but until they had a single platform, they weren't able to show the value and the coordination and the orchestration of all that. So again, it looks like a press release or something tactical until you start seeing the entire picture of what's going on. And uh, they're gonna need systems to be able to amplify that. We're seeing more and more sophisticated programs specifically about name your company for startups, Amex for startups, Visa for startups, et cetera. Um, and the objectives aren't just exclusively innovation. It could be the future of their business, but it could also just be accelerating part of their stack, part of their ways of working, digitizing their, their supply chain, et cetera. Does that make sense? Or, yeah, or, or all of the above, right? Uh, which, yeah. which is which is always and a desperate, yeah, and a, de a desperate attempt to do so because uh, not doing so again has more of that sh um, ha has more impact on the short termism. That said, when I'm talking about these programs, even venture programs, these are protected programs. These are programs that have got a five to seven year window, and they've got funding locked in for that that kind of time frame for exactly the uh, challenge. But that's coming from the top. You know, so I, I guess if you want to see the most innovative companies, take a look at the top. They say, what do they say? The fish swims from the head forward or rots from the head down, right? <laughs> indeed, indeed. And John, <laughs> before I turn it over to you, I just want to remind everybody to please uh, share with us where you're tuning in from, share your observations. I'm sharing those on screen as well in real time. Uh, and uh, John, over to you. Well, it sounds like uh, you've developed a kind of a a meta theory or a meta framework for innovation that it, uh, in a sense, is like an umbrella over the <clears throat> innovation practices that these various corporate clients or uh, uh, organizations come to you with. I mean, it sounds like people are coming to you with their current situation. You diagnose what's missing or uh, where the gaps are, uh, and then uh, you're kind of a roundhouse for filling those things in a network, if, if you will, an ecosystem, to use your word. There, It sounds like there is a meta theory that, uh, or a, a meta approach to innovation that overlays this. And I'm wondering what you've learned about innovation that you didn't know when you started this process and uh, what you would say about that notion of uh, a meta theory that kind of transcends the specifics of, you know, all the clients that come in to see you. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, we're a SaaS platform, to be really clear. Um, uh, so when you say the clients come to us with problems, the you know, it's, it's like saying a client comes to a CRM with a problem of selling or marketing or something like, else like that. And that there's, if there's something meta, meta, it's that they want to do business. There's a recognition of a problem. Um, and they, they want systems to help them, um, address that. Um, I think that's kind of the meta version of it in terms of what I learned. Um, uh, I've learned that. Uh, innovation and the KPIs around innovation are really challenging. Um, so uh, it takes a real strategy to be able to go in there and at a, at a corporate level and define large spaces. Um, I've learned that there are a um, hundred different program types and ecosystem partners for you to engage with, whether it's in government or education or the accelerators and incubators or consultancies. Um, one of one consultancy pegs this entire space at about a fifty billion dollars space. So just to give you an idea of how how big this is, and I think you know if you think about it, these trillion dollar trillion dollar industries are, are going to desperately 
um, avoid disruption or uh, obsolescence. So of course they're going to spend money uh, to to try to uh, get better at working with outside innovation, moving faster, leaner, etc. Uh, so so it's, it's a big space. It's coming together in a way, and it's maturing in a way that uh, we predicted. But it's taking time. And I think what we're seeing is we're seeing for the first time a 2.0 version of innovation where 1.0 might have been the scouts. 1.0 may have looked like a petting zoo. It may have looked like a lot of experimentation. But we're finally seeing a 2.0, a real maturation of people who come in and understand what good looks like and are implementing vast programs to make changes to your core business and find new businesses and markets. And the $50 billion figure is what it's innovation services it's what what is that number it's yeah it's a whole shoot match it's it's the consulting over uh innovation services it's the scouting and scanning it's the um it's the uh software that's going to be enabling it um you know we believe that you know, the the largest consultancies the deloitte the accentures the eys ey has over 25 groups using Kite right now and over a thousand people yeah. using our platform to orchestrate and share what they're seeing and then share, um, deliver those insights to their customers. Um, that gives you an idea of what a maturity model, what good looks like and what scale looks like. Hmm. And I'm curious, you know, a lot of um, the innovation that really matters is um, uh, adheres to a broader ecosystem of public sector and community and citizens and NGOs. And you could argue that innovation is important, not just for increasing shareholder value, but for increasing societal value and, and well-being. And um, uh, yeah, I'm curious to know where you fit in that kind of social innovation, if I can use that cliched term, yeah. uh, agenda. Yeah, but, I, hmm? I'm, glad you, I'm glad you're asking. Actually, I. I I think it's great. One of the things that as you as you lead an industry or develop an industry, you can shape an industry. Um, mm -hmm. And so that from the earliest days, we actually have said, look, just because this looks like you know innovation and things that you've done before, it's innovation. We can do things differently. So sure. from the very beginning, we started pushing DEI, for instance, as one of the things, all the benefits of innovation shouldn't accrue to people who look like me. <laughs> they should actually, uh, we, we, we should actually try doing things differently. And so a lot of these innovation programs we see, just like the venture programs, I think vent, the corporate venture programs and the corporate um, innovation programs are leading when it comes to diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion over the rest of the industry. So I think corporations have a major role in it. I think the ecosystems out there, like you were talking about government and, and um, EDU have a real uh, 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 role in helping continue to develop communities of, of underrepresented um, uh, talent. So, um, so in, in that particular area, we see leading, we see innovation leading in that area. And we think that you're gonna see some really interesting numbers coming out of that in the coming years. Um, when you think about some of the other big intractable societal challenges, you'll see corporations using these innovation programs to lead with sustainability, to lead with how do we create a more equitable uh, 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 company as well as a go-to-market strategy, et cetera. So we see some of those societal things leading in innovation, not as a checkbox and something that we have to comply with. Yeah, and, and we hope that lots of companies will uh, start to do that and the efforts will be more organized. But if you just take a half step back and you know, for, for instance, look at um, the challenges of, um, uh, you know, the transitioning to a green economy or climate change or uh, uh, school safety or whatever. There, There's tremendous room for innovation that doesn't necessarily uh, adhere to a, a, a financial bottom line, a corporate bottom line. And, um, you know, you, you develop these power tools for uh, accelerating and making innovation processes more efficient. And I'm wondering how those power tools uh, can uh, accelerate and align with um, societal requirements that may or may not be uh, pure um, uh, capitalism. Or yeah, whether that's, that's part of your, part of yeah. your agenda. Well, no, I, I, our agenda is absolutely to support, support that. Um, your your software and your 
business has to reflect your core values as well. I mean, it just yeah. it shows up in your, your core values and your, your approach. Um, let me give you a maturity model on that is Comcast has a multi-program uh, prong program um, out of Philadelphia uh, where uh, they have a group called Lift Labs, which partnered with Techstars to run an incubator accelerator. Part of their remit was specifically to find uh, founders of color and underrepresented uh, founders, but they've gone beyond that. They actually have programs specifically, they've just announced today a partnership with Black VC. Uh, they, are, they, they have programs specifically designed to bring Comcast into um, uh, specifically black, BIPOC, but specifically black communities, um, which have been underserved and underrepresented. And you look at that and you, you, you could say that isn't related to the bottom line, that's the right thing to do. Um, I think it's actually incredibly capitalistic. I think these are underrepresented um, markets as well. Um, and and I know that someone somewhere is doing the back of the napkin saying a better market uh, is uh, lifts, lifts the tide for all of us uh, a decade from now, et cetera. So creating long, loyal customers in these communities is is a commercial. So I don't I don't think they're necessarily an either or, but you need a program to uh, in, embark on that um, on that uh, on that uh, journey to be able to say how we actually outreach and make an intentional effort to. Uh, right systemic uh, uh, biases and issues. I mean, you'll be hearing a lot about the Endless Frontier Act, which is making its way uh, through Congress. And, um, you know, that's the client there is really the United States. And in a, in a more narrow sense, it's Congress, um, which is going to allocate quite a bit of money to creating regional hubs and, you know, with all of the fanfare around supporting local entrepreneurship and things of this kind. And it would seem like you're um, assets would be very valuable, but then it's a different business model from uh, aligning with, uh, you know, corporate venture programs or amplifying the um, impact of innovation consultants. Yeah, I'll say it here. We'll make our software available for those efforts. We, um, uh, we absolutely know that we have a role in accelerating um, and, and um, leapfrogging the lack of sophistication in some of these areas. Um, uh, so, so bringing them up to speed to the state of the art. Um, and so we'll make that available even at cost if we need to. Well, I'm, I happen to be talking to the legislators in question next week. So I'll, uh, uh <laughs> we, have, we have you on video. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, that's all right. We, we back our promises. Yeah. The power, <laughs> the power of intersections. I'm happy to make the, uh, whatever links are appropriate. Uh, so Brian, back over to you. Yeah, well, I want to close out on one thing because our next guest is backstage uh, and just sort of to echo uh, and reinforce what Mark was saying is that even in our own research at Salesforce, we had a report come out uh, recently called the State of the Connected Customer. And when we look at the business customer's priorities and the, also the consumer's priorities, there's a lot of alignment to show that innovation just isn't about technology. It's also in business models. It's also in societal impact. Uh, in fact, the top two things that... Uh, aside from digital, that customers wanted to see from businesses post-pandemic was earning trustworthiness and also uh, investing in environmental practices. And what we've already seen in 2020 was that 61% of customers have stopped buying from companies uh, that didn't align with their values. And so this is incredibly important moving forward, something that we don't necessarily talk about uh, often enough that we'll need to prioritize moving forward. Uh, and Mark, before we let you go, I just want to ask you one question. I'm sure you're hearing uh, more, more than not is what happens post pandemic? Does Silicon Valley still have its magnetism towards startups, entrepreneurs, ideas, and also though the ecosystem that wants to partner and, and promote with them, uh, promote them? Yeah, I think if you take a look at the long arc of history, um, uh, other pandemics and other disruptions didn't displace France as a center for fashion. It didn't displace Hollywood as a center for um, uh, making images. Um, and it certainly isn't going dis to displace Silicon Valley, even though you know the mayor of Miami is doing a great job of recruiting people down there. Um, uh, a lot of us look at in, in this kind of a weather at, at places like Austin and say that'd be a fun place to be. Uh, but there really is nothing like once uh, we get shots in our arms and we're back together, there's nothing like the serendipity and the intersectionality of Silicon Valley. Um, it's, it's an ecosystem. It's a way of working. Uh, the, the legal structure here about the right to work and the IP rights 
um, are, are unlike any other place. You can replicate it, but you got a lot of catching up to do. So I think uh, Silicon Valley's back. It's booming. It's where people want to be. I love it. I love it. Well, <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I'll, I'll reach out. I'll be uh, I'll be in town here shortly, and maybe uh, we can convince the missus to let you out for a motorcycle ride. <laughs> and a motorcycle ride. Let's do it. Sounds fun. Great seeing you guys. Mark, great to meet you. Awesome. Great Thanks. to see you. Uh, all right. Well, let me get our, uh, I think I'm still multitasking here. I am. All Good right. Man. Well, learning how to do these things in real time. Uh, thank you uh, for all who are joining us. Please do share your comments, where you're tuning in from, share your observations. Uh, please make sure to spread the word. I wanted to read to you, John, before we bring uh, our next guest on a tweet from Linda Montgomery that I just saw. She said that she's taken in some weekly innovation thinking and insights with cool guests uh, hosted by you and and uh, and Wah. Uh, but this is what I thought was really cool. She says it's like you're in Palo Alto having a chat and a coffee with them. Uh, very cool. Thank you, Linda, wow. for that comment. That's a real compliment. Uh, John, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our next guest. Sure. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to bring on Kate Stone. I um, had the um, uh, uh, unique opportunity to collaborate with Kate when we were judges for the um, Global MIDI Association's uh, innovation competition. And MIDI is Musical Instrument Digital Interface, which is really how musical instruments speak with computers and with each other uh, to create um, uh, uh, music making capabilities that were never possible before. So we were on this panel and she started talking about all this amazing stuff that she was doing for uh, brands uh, with particular reference to a very intriguing uh, genre of technology that had to do with touch activated printable surfaces. She's uh, uh, English by background and an English engineer by professional background and CEO and founder of Novalia, which is a company that actually is doing this work, but I suspect has many other interests uh, as well. So Kate, uh, it's a pleasure to see you. Welcome to the show. Oh, are you on? Hey, is that better? Yeah, much better. You you fell into the classic, uh, hey, you're on mute uh, trap. So uh, I know, I know. It's, the, it's the phrase. It's the phrase of the of the last twelve months, right? It's great. I mean, I've even started, you know, but I'm not on mute, just faking it, you know, just yeah, right. a bit of interest. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I I I um I have all sorts of all sorts of tricks up my sleeve. Um, I have an assistant who every now and again brings me a cup of tea when I need a cup of tea. So she's called Other Kate. Um, she always uh, looks after me in the need. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> That's hey, great. Brian, can you give me a cup of coffee? <laughs> yeah, we, we've we've uh, gotten our value from this interview already. This is just uh, so remarkable. Well, it's, a, it's a new medium, though, right? It's a new medium. We've got to explore how to play with it. It's not just Zoom calls. <laughs> we just we discovered that every day. You know, I, I I said to Brian that you know if you reflect on the beginnings of the film business. Uh, it was, you know, people hauling lights around and trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to do uh, camera angles on a star's face and all of this kind of very rough stuff. And, you know, so we, we, we love, in a, in a sense, the roughness of the medium because it, it makes us feel very free. The, the question that I guess would be great to hear from you on uh, just at the outset is um, tell us a little bit about Navalia and also tell us a little bit about what is currently um, engaging your interest and attention. Because my sense was from our brief interaction around the MIDI Awards that you, you know, you've got a lot of things going. Yeah, oh, you know, my head gets very busy. I mean, it's, it's, I have um, a curious a curious brain that tries to explore the mind that is that is everything that's around me. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess what I've kind of realized over my life that, that my fascination is, is how can I use technology, um, really since I was a child, how can I use whatever tech I find around me to trigger an emotion in another human being? Um, you know, that's, that's really kind of, looking back what i've done since i was a child you know when i when i was a kid it was wires and microphones switches building radio transmitters and hiding them in my bedroom and you know it wasn't the tech and it was a little bit of being cheeky but it was about 
just creating that moment for my siblings of something being not quite what it was, which is now I'm realizing it's that exactly, um, it's exactly that childish thing that I just did with my disappearing cup and, you know, making my head disappear. Um, I, <laughs> I just can't help it. Um, and, and it's always about how can I do it with what's around me? So over the last 15 years, the company that I've um, built called Novalia, which is predominantly based in the UK, um, is about how can we use conductive ink when printed on items that are often normally printed, so a poster, a book, um, album cover, um, to add touch sensitivity to that object and then allow it to trigger hum a human emotion, surprise, delight, wonder, or, or you know, make someone cry, even in a good way, hopefully. Um, and you know, and we do that with the conductive ink to create the user interface and then have graphics on top so you just see a normal poster. And then we hide a little circuit board on the back that's just pressed on the back that has a chip running software that projects a field through the paper, sends its signals along the conductive ink, and then the chip knows where and when you've touched. And then it can either play sound um, um, through a little hidden speaker or there's a version that has a Bluetooth chip on there and a really thin battery. And so then that can Bluetooth to your cell phone and make something happen on your cell phone. So I don't have any, I should have had some things around me. So I do, oh, I do actually, um, like this is, um, this is a notebook that's um, also has a, um, a fold out Bluetooth keyboard. So the idea is a musician can be writing their music and then they wonder what it might, sound like their idea in their head and then they can actually play it on this midi keyboard that pairs with their cell phone and um and then it will save the music in their cell phone as well as you know you've got your ideas written down there as well so you know one day you're looking through and it's like oh yeah that was there's was some cool lyrics you know what was i thinking and then you can go what was i hearing and then you know you can hear it back so i uh, just i don't know all sorts of things so we um i've put midi on my baseball cap so when i touch the brim of my baseball cap it triggers air horns, lasers, <laughs> various noises because, you know, are you? I'm sure. I don't know. Like me, like you're in that moment, and certain music needs a resolve, and that resolve just has to be an air horn. Um, <laughs> um, or we've done a lot of things for brands. So we've made Pizza Hut's um, box, so you could DJ on the box. We did that in the UK. We made McDonald's tray liner. You DJ on the box. I, I remember you talking about this. But what is that experience? Yeah, so the Pizza Hut's box in the UK, we only did a few, it's only a handful of them, but you could open the box and then there was two turntables, an image of two turntables. You could DJ with the pizza box and it connects to your laptop and it's a DJ controller. So if you want some, some cheesy beats on your pizza, then <laughs> I guess that's what you do. Um, I should have prepared some some demos. I, I never really thought. I, yeah. <laughs> There's always the option of a, of a return visit at some point because uh, this is all very intriguing. What what have you discovered about the deployment of this technology? You said it's a your priority is evoking some authentic emotion, um, and you've been messing around with technology for a long time. So what do you what do you know now that you didn't know when you were starting off on this journey? I, I think just even more so that it's never about technology; it's always about humans, and you know that's something that I already felt. Um, and there's a, a lot of philosophy for me personally behind what I do, but it's just, you know, more of that is we always have to think about people, um, you know, what makes human beings be human beings? How do we work? What triggers us? What are, you know, what are our emotions and what is the purpose of the technology? Um, and, you know, so I always try and think about that more than more than anything else mm. um and that's you know that's just that's a core thing oh thanks for getting that up yeah oh, great. um yeah um so i mean i think that that's a key thing but just also how hard it is to start and run a business and get it to profitability is really really hard um you know and i've kind of realized that that it's about um you need not just talent um, not just tenacity, but you also need timing. Um, and so, you know, the right thing happening at the right time, the right opportunity, um, you know, so those are kind of like the three T's to, you know, to success in, in a way, timing, technology, and, and tenacity. Mm. So it sounds like part of your mission, maybe implicit mission, is to 
place music into the world into uh, novel ways because, and you know, for the audience out there who may not be super familiar with MIDI, it's not just what um, allows your synthesizer on stage to talk to your Mac, to talk to your PA system, but um, it, it's basically becoming a universal um, language for digital uh, uh, expression to occur uh, in a variety of uh, formats, right? So even you talking about your uh, hat and uh, uh, it triggering the air horn and things of this kind. So wh where do you see that going? I'm, uh, you know, I mean, I personally speaking for myself as someone who loves music, I'm very happy to see music kind of pervade our environment in in different kinds of ways. Where do you, where do you see this all going? Um, well, beyond music, really. I mean, you know, <laughs> just the way my mind works is wherever I am, I imagine if I could touch anything and it could trigger sounds um, and it could be musical, you know, what 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 would that be? If I walk down the street and step on the stepping stones, in my head, it's triggering beats and, and sounds. So, you know, we've done that. We've done those types of things quite a lot. Um, and, you know, and it, and it often comes back to music. And so we've done that for brands. What you're seeing now is a wall in the street we built in Austin that was 50 foot long and had hundreds of touch points on. And people who were in a line could could trigger, um, they could trigger beats, loops, you know, and things. So, yeah, these are a bunch of things that we've done for, for different brands. But, um, you know, that, that's, that's just music, right? So, you know, the, the way I see it is that, Imagine if anything, any ordinary object around us can respond in some way if you were to touch it. And I'm not saying that every object will, I'm just saying that it could. Imagine if the, our portal to technology was not through something that looked like this, you know, that looked like a piece of technology. Imagine if every ordin everyday ordinary objects could know when they've been touched and then can connect to each other and to the cloud and then can cause things to happen. Um, and and I, I just believe that a combination of, we often design through a nostalgic eye. So often when we design things, we make them, you know, we make them look old fashioned, right? You know, mm -hmm. when digital radio came out, digital radios looked, I guess, like this thing next to me, right? Yeah. This is actually an old, an old thing. Right. Yeah you know and, and we go back to vinyl i mean so we design things from a nostalgic point of view so that's how things look combine that with the fact that technology is shrinking you know to, um a computer used to fill a room then a desk then a lap then a hand wrist someone put a chip in my hand i don't know what i, I did use it once to open a my hotel door room in baltimore once that's the only time i've ever used the chip in my hand but um but, but the point is, is technology is shrinking, so it can go with inside anything. Combine that with nostalgic design. I believe that the future could look more like the past than the present, that you could walk into a room and cast a spell. You could, you know, with your voice, you could say something, I wish you can now, right? You could, you know, touch an object and, you know, and, 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 and the right thing will happen. And so I think, you know, that's one of the reasons there's nostalgia and, and shrinking technology is a reason why the future could look more like the past than the present. Um, and, you know, I believe there are other reasons, um, you know, there's at least five other reasons I can think of why the future will also look more like the past than the present, which is, which is to do with the fact that recognizing that our environment is our mind, half of our mind is our environment. So when we design an object, um, a space, a place, or journey through that place, we're actually designing the insides of people's minds, um, you know. And so, when we start to think about that, then that could curate and create the ways that we design things that end up looking old-fashioned. I think the fact that we've removed so much friction from our lives with the progress of technology, you know, from the long journey of technology, from you know, stone tools and recreating fire. We've removed so much friction from our lives that humans are almost no longer required in their own life. And it disconnects us from our environment. And building friction back into our lives is incredibly important. Growing our food, preparing our food, choosing our food, hmm. um, you know, and uh, all, all, all sorts of things, you know, getting up and turning the vinyl, the vinyl over. Um, <laughs> just we're, we're celebrating going back. We need to do old fashioned things, chop the firewood, you know, um, actually read a book, maybe actually write, because friction makes every moment meaningful, mindful, and memorable. 
And so we will need to go back to doing those things for our mental health reasons, um, I, I, I do believe. And I also believe for resilience and the purpose of resilience for, um, you know, as, as actually um, surviving as a species and, and not destroying the planet too much, we have to go back to doing things in old fashioned ways as well. And I believe, you know, that will also um, potentially create a future more like the past than the present. And, you know, and there, there are multiple reasons I keep thinking of, you know, communication, we need to create, go back to old fashioned versions of communication where we can build community, where every voice is heard. Um, we will build richer communities um, and we will have a better life. You know, I've been saying that because I've become obsessed with the last year with ham radio um, and during the pandemic, um, I connected with an awesome group of friends who I'd never seen and never met. And we only connected via ham radio at 8.35 every single day. And we built an amazing community. Um, and it made me realize how powerful a voice only old fashioned um, form of, you know, a community that could build. So I was really stunned to discover a few weeks ago Clubhouse and see how powerful say, Clubhouse like is. Clubhouse. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, Clubhouse is like, you know, where ham radio meets talk radio and everyone can be beautiful because it's based around not how you present yourself, but how vulnerable you're prepared to be and, and what you have inside and how you can share it. And so for all of these reasons and more, um, it makes me think we're going home, we're not going to a scary future. So it's a long answer to a question of which I've now forgotten what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, there's so much that we could explore. I want to make sure that uh, we get uh, Brian in because I know he's got uh, questions as well. I'll just make a comment, which is that this notion of friction, I think, is really important because it's how we learn. You know, I mean, when you make music, it even relates to learning instruments. You know, when you uh, uh, undertake to learn the piano uh, and you have to, if you're a jazz guy, you have to learn how to play the altered scale in 12 keys. There's friction involved in learning that, which changes your yeah. brain and also uh, it, it, it evidences self-discipline and, um, and affirms the value of practice. And if your music making is button pushing, You'll still you'll, you'll have the creative side, but you won't necessarily have had the learning side of the practice and the discipline. So I think there's a yeah. very important message uh, in there. So hey, Brian. And, what, and, uh, oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry, just one, just one yeah, little sure. thing. And just and how how music sounds when you add dissonance, which is the musical equivalence of friction. Um, you know that makes music work more. In film, you add tension. You know, so we, we have to take these things and disturb them a little bit and we actually create more meaningful, memorable um, you know, experiences. It's interesting you say that because I um, think so much of uh, the media, the education, many in businesses is about making things easier so they're more palatable. I mean, I just spoke with somebody who represents uh, speakers uh, uh, for speaker bureaus and, you know, she said it's all about selling the easy uh, presentation that uh, satisfies some kind of entertainment value and makes things simple. And it's not about the friction no. of engaging with intellectual content that's challenging, but ultimately much more valuable. So we're, we're kind of in this Eloy moment uh, in our culture that uh, we need to kind of uh, uh, fight against. Um, so uh, Brian, over to you. I want to well, make sure you get, you get you, your voice in as well. Kate, Kate, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know what we should do, John? Uh, we should continue this on Clubhouse, on our new Intersections Club that we're uh, we're sure. going to be launching here shortly. Uh, so let's, Kate, if you're open to that, we'd love to have you on. Yeah. And, and, and we'd love you to be our first guest on that. So we'll, yes. we'll circle back yes, on please. that. Because I have more questions than I'm going to have to be able to squeeze yeah. in here. Uh, one thing that I studied uh, was skeuomorphism. Uh, and sort of the idea of what Apple was trying to do with its approach to nostalgia to help push people forward and toward, toward innovation. So, for example, with the iPhone, many of the original uh, icons for the apps were based mm. upon the analog predecessors mm. like a calendar, like a notebook, mm -hmm. uh, for, for example. And uh, I never thought of it, though, um, from uh, the nostalgia I got. But the idea of friction, I'd never connected the dots until... I heard you speak about it. So, for example, one of the, the things that I that I learned when I was going through the last book I wrote called Lifescale, which was essentially saying, this has rewired my brain and my body. 
Uh, I'm going to rewire it more productively moving forward rather than being distracted or controlled by it. Uh, but that's now an intentional movement that I'm I'm making a decision, an intentional, purposeful decision to move in this direction. And this is what it looks like. One of the techniques I used to force myself into a new, let's just say, foundation to learn in a new way was I didn't know friction, which was I used the uh, the Pomodoro technique for focusing for 25 minutes on vinyl. So I would put a record on, start it. The sensation, everything would just kind of get me in the mindset, sit down, work until I had to get up and flip it over. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I noticed that over time, I was actually rewiring myself for creativity. I re regained uh, my practice of cursive writing for the same exact reason uh, to exercise not just my handwriting or penmanship, but just to connect the dots that I was losing. Uh, only to see that I was actually more open-minded, more creative, uh, <laughs> not as stressed. Uh, and so these are all beautiful things. All to set up for probably the only question I'll get in here today, <laughs> which is in a world where, for example, this last year we're seeing a dramatic acceleration in AI and automation, uh, a dramatic acceleration in digital first behaviors. What is the message that innovators and leaders have to hear about the importance of connecting the dots between sort of this invisible tech that we're going to start to see in our everyday lives and the past to keep us on an intentional path and a productive path forward, not losing ourselves to it. Easy question, I'm sure. Well, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's lots of different directions that my brain goes with how, you know, you know, because there's, there's multiple things we have to, we have to think about. We have to think about where are we going? What are we trying? What are we trying to achieve? You know, like what, why are we doing all of this? What are we trying to achieve? Do we want humans to be part of the equation? Um, you know, in, in, in the place, in the place that, that, that we're going, do we actually understand how powerful the human brain and mind is? Um, and and how we can actually engage in it in potentially um, a more productive way, um, you know that that's that's really important. And you know, um, yeah, I just think we we know we have to put humans first and understand how humans work. And you know, the other aspect that I mentioned is our mind, and this is something that that I I really what you were doing with. I, I believe half we have two mind, two halves to our mind, just like our brain has two halves. Our mind is something entirely different. Our mind is not an organ. Um, our mind is kind of the software that runs on the machine, but it's more than that. Half of our mind is in our head and body. Half of our mind is our environment. The two halves to our mind to create a full mind are connected via our five known senses. And so if you want to remind yourself, make yourself more mindful, open your mind, it's not about what's in here. It's about everything that's out here. So if you want to change your behavior and how you think about things, um, what you were doing is using that vinyl, that record to, um, to as part of your mind. And so we need to engage with our environment because half of who we are is our environment. Um, and then that means all of our minds overlap. And so that's when you kind of get this sense of oneness. And that ultimately, you know, your mind is the whole universe. So we just need to be thinking that everything around us, everything we design is part of someone's mind. And so, you know, actually we're mind surgeons when we, when we design anything. And I, I just, but to get that, to get there and to see that you have to drop ego. You have to let go of the ego and thinking that this is just me. I can control everything. If you want to open your mind, all you have to do is travel. Just the act of traveling going somewhere else, having an experience you've not had before, literally opens your mind and expands your mind because your mindset, like a stage set, your mindset is the space around you. And so if we can start to create technology that's embedded in the things around us, um, you know, that all becomes part of who we are. Um, and I think we should see things like that because then we're not looking at just humans and tech. We're looking, we're taking a systems approach and we have to really understand very powerful part of that system. And that's that's humans. And remembering that our brain is a reality machine that conjures up the most amazing reality. It's the most, uh, you know, the most powerful reality machine that, 
that, that we know of. And so we don't have to do everything so literally with technology. All we have to do is trigger this amazing thing to create um, the illusions of reality. I think, uh, wow, uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, we just had our own uh, personal TED Talk, uh, and <laughs> I love that. I love that. I can't wait to continue this conversation, Kate. I, I think that uh, I, I just, I'm very inspired. So thank you, and thank you oh, for thank joining you. us. To be thank you. Kate. Thanks, Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. See you on Clubhouse, um, or see you on Ham Radio. KD2, RYD, Kilo Delta 2, Romeo Yankee Delta. <laughs> and for now, I'll say 7 3 and clear on your final. <laughs> oh my gosh, my mind is on fire right now. Wow. My heart is on fire. I love that. I love that. Well, John, thank you uh, for, uh, again, another wonderful episode. Uh, oh, always you. enjoy our time together. I, I look forward to seeing you uh, live in person next week and uh, yeah. to have a good old fashioned dinner uh, Excellent. And, and plan for the future. And, and for all of those who tune in today, thank you so much. Uh, you make this show, uh, you, uh, you share with us the things that touch you and that also touches us back. It inspires us to, uh, to think about what other types of guests, uh, what they're working on, uh, the art that they're creating uh, to bring them on the show. Uh, so thank you for being part of the Intersections community. Uh, and on that note, I think what I'll do is send us out with uh, one of my favorite artists, John Kao, playing the piano. <laughs>